This is a short video on the basic tools required to do electronic assembly and repairs. This equipment is very useful for the engineer, technologist, technician, or even the home hobbyist. First you will need a good soldering iron. A soldering iron with a pencil point tip or chisel tip. It should have a wattage anywhere from 25 watts to 40 watts. If you're just starting out, a 35 watt soldering iron would be ideal. This soldering iron has a pencil point tip. All soldering irons will have the wattage rating marked on them. This soldering iron has a 25 watt rating. There are a wide variety of tips that you can use in soldering irons. This particular soldering iron has a very fine chisel tip. Soldering irons will always have their wattage rating marked on them somewhere. This soldering iron has the 40 watt rating stamped right on the handle. Soldering irons do not need to be very expensive. These two examples cost around $10 each. Soldering irons like the ones shown here in the picture have no use on a printed circuit board. The tips are far too large. The lower one has a wattage rating of 50 watts. The iron shown in the top of the picture has a wattage of 100 watts. This would just totally destroy the printed circuit board and the parts that you're trying to attach to the circuit board. I always suggest to my students to purchase a pencil type soldering iron. Do not purchase ones that look like a gun. You will not have the fine motor control while soldering. Also, try to stay away from the butane or gas-powered soldering irons. They're great if you want to be MacGyver and have a little problem when you crash your plane. I really find that the butane-powered soldering irons are not very useful in the home or lab environment. We'll leave those for MacGyver. To keep your iron from burning things that are on the workbench, it's a good idea to get a soldering iron stand. I've seen it far too often in the lab environment where soldering irons have burnt holes into laptops, tablets, book binders, and even the odd elbow has gotten it. A tip cleaning sponge is always very handy. These are sponges that are slightly dampened so that we can clean the tip while we're soldering and in between soldering joints. It should be dampened with water but not soaking wet. If you do not want to shock the soldering iron tip using a damp sponge, a stainless steel scouring pad can be used to clean the soldering iron tip while soldering. All you do is just push the iron tip into the scouring pad, pull it out, and the abrasive action of the scouring pad will clean the tip. There's many different types of solder that we can use for soldering. On a circuit board, we'd like to use a tin lead based solder. It will have a 60-40 ratio. I suggest getting a diameter anywhere from 0.4 millimeters to 0.8 millimeters. The finer solder will be good for smaller joints and the larger solder for larger joints. There are some lead free solders, silver solders, there's even solders that have an acid core which is used for plumbing. I would not recommend using plumbing solder on a circuit board as the flux inside the solder is corrosive. To start off with, I always like to have my students work with a leaded based solder because it's much easier to start to learn how to solder. Once you've perfected your technique soldering with a leaded base solder, it's a good idea to tr try to learn how to use the lead-free solders. They do not flow as nice or provide as nice a finish, but they are more environmentally friendly. All of the solders used for printed circuit board work will have a flux core. There are many methods of removing solder from a printed circuit board. Here are two examples of a manual solder sucker, extractor, or solder pull. Both work equally the same. The larger blue one requires a two-hand operation, whereas the smaller one can be operated with a single hand. Here is another example of a solder sucker, but the advantage with this one is that if you squeeze the ball quickly, you can have a stream of air blowing towards a circuit board, moving solder away or through a hole. It all depends as to what you're trying to do. 
Another method of removing solder from a printed circuit board is using solder wick or solder braid. This works very easily and is very efficient. What you do is you place the solder braid over the solder joint and then put your soldering iron on top of the solder braid and once the joint becomes hot enough the solder wicks into the braid. I like using the solder wick for the final cleanup on a circuit board. It's always handy to have some 4-0 super fine steel wool to clean your soldering iron. Occasionally what happens we have a lot of burnt particles that build up on the end of the soldering iron tip and if we just rub the soldering iron into the 4-0 fine steel wool it'll clean it up nicely. Every once in a while it's a good idea to retin your soldering iron tip. I tend to be a little more aggressive with this task as I will take the soldering iron tip when it's hot and reached full operating temperature and just put it into this acid soldering paste and then wipe it clean in the steel wool, a 4-0 fine steel wool. I will then melt some leaded solder on the soldering iron tip, then dip it quickly into the acid flux and then wipe it clean with the steel wool. I'll keep repeating this process until the tip is fully tinned. It's always a good idea to have a little wee bit of electrical tape. Make sure that it is CSA or ULC approved. The CSA or ULC markings will always be marked on the inner cardboard roll of the electrical tape. It's always a good idea to have a roll of masking tape. I use masking tape to hold parts on a circuit board that are wiggling around on me or might fall off the board when I flip the board upside down to solder the part onto the circuit board. There are many types of wire strippers that you can get. The one on the left is a dual purpose tool. It'll, it is a side cutter and automatic wire stripper. The other two can be set to a wire gauge and then used for that particular wire gauge once the adjustment has been made. This is a cheaper automatic wire stripper. I picked this one up from the dollar store. It did work quite well. You can probably expect it to work and then all of a sudden self-destruct, but they do tend to work quite well while they are still in the working mode. This is a little more professional type automatic wire stripper, crimper. They work very, very well, but is a little bit more expensive than the other wire strippers in the previous slides. It's always a good idea to have a small set of side cutters. I like the side cutters that have a spring load in the handle so that the jaws open up automatically. It makes it easy when I'm cutting resistor or capacitor leads off and a number of them on a circuit board. Remember now, we're not working on a jumbo jet or Mack truck. We only need small side cutters for the circuit board work that we intend to do. Another handy item to have in your toolkit would be a pair of needle nose pliers. Again, they should be fairly small. Here we have a straight jaw set and then a bent jaw pair of needle nose pliers. Either would work really quite well for small circuit board work. A small set of precision screwdrivers, commonly referred to as jeweler screwdrivers, both slotted and Phillips, are always handy. We, we can use these for adjusting small trim pots that are on a printed circuit board. A small set of tweezers is always very handy to handle small electronic parts. You might even find one of these in your bathroom drawer. The basic toolkit is almost complete. One of the items that we really need is a set of helping hands. Here we have a heavy metal base with a couple bars and alligator clips. We use this to hold our circuit board while we are soldering parts or wires on it. I sometimes even use these to hold uh, wires while I'm soldering an electrical connector onto the end of a wire. As parts are getting smaller and smaller in the electronic world, it's always nice to be able to read the coding or the part number off the parts. A magnifying glass will always make this job much easier. We often use magnifying glasses to look for faults on printed circuit boards after it's been soldered. 
Once we're finished soldering a printed circuit board, it's always a good idea to clean the flux off the circuit board. To do that, I always like using isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol that is 90% or better pure is the best to use on a printed circuit board. I always pour a little wee bit into the cap and then dip the toothbrush into the cap and then rub the printed circuit board with the toothbrush until it's clean. I never dip the toothbrush into the bottles because they will contaminate the whole bottle and I don't really want to do that. As you become more advanced, you'll keep adding to the toolkit that you have already started here in this video. It will just never end. Good luck and enjoy this new career or hobby you're embarking on.